All right, let's take our Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 5 tonight. And I'm going to preach a message that's going to exclude some people, but only for uh, a short time. <clears throat> it will, you will be excluded. And I'm going to uh, preach tonight on seven ways to love your spouse. <clears throat> seven ways to love your spouse. So there's a few that perhaps may not be able to uh, enjoy. And, uh, but but uh, I know you've been married for a long time, but you can still enjoy the message, hopefully. And also the kids, uh, that'll be coming not too long. Teens, a little bit less time. And uh, singles, it may never happen. <clears throat> but we pray. We pray that way. And uh, I always worked with the college and career. I said, when I was there, I always told them, uh, it, it, don't worry about it. The Lord has somebody for you, and it's just a matter of time. But uh, it'll either be in this lifetime or it'll be in the millennium when, when we come back and we're here and you've got a lot of time and good health and you'll look better and uh, all those things. We'll see what happens. I'm just teasing, of course. But uh, we've got some widows here tonight, some widowers as well. And uh, so I understand who I'm preaching to, but I believe this, that uh, strong churches are built on strong families. And, uh, and more technically, I would say, strong churches are built on strong Christians. And it just so happens that uh, the Lord's plan is for one man and one woman to have one lifetime together and to raise their children together. And for those children to then go on and do the same type of a thing. The majority of churches are made up of uh, folks that are married. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. Ephesians chapter 5 is a passage that we've been memorizing in uh, Home Builders class. And uh, working on, on doing this, it's a whole lot easier to read it than it is to memorize it. And it's a whole lot easier to memorize it than it is to live it. And so tonight, as we go through Ephesians chapter 5, ask the Lord to speak to your heart. And Lord willing, we'll be out of here so fast it'll make your head spin. All right? Ephesians chapter 5. Let's begin reading in verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Uh, the devil is attacking marriages today like never before. Uh, the world is attacking marriages like never before. Uh, it, is high, it is more likely for uh, the average person in America to live together and try things out to see how things will work or they won't work without ever getting married. That has become the norm. That is what most people do. And it seems to make sense because why, I mean, you wouldn't take, you wouldn't buy a car sight unseen, so why don't you just uh, try it out and see if it'll work, and if it doesn't work, then you didn't waste the paper and the ink that the marriage license was written on. And there are so many things wrong with that, I don't know where to begin. But I'll just suffice it to say that if you live together and you're unmarried, it's called adultery as far as God's concerned, and it's wrong. You say, who says it's wrong? It doesn't matter if the church says it's okay. It doesn't matter if your friends say it's okay or your mom and dad. Uh, and, and I can't imagine a mom and dad let their son or daughter live in adultery in their own house. Not sure how that would work with standing before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. Actually, I know how that would work. You would be ashamed, and you ought to be ashamed. Uh, but the, the point I'm making is that adultery, we didn't come up with that, uh, that idea. <laughs> I didn't come up with that idea. Why would I? Why would any man come up with that idea? That's God's idea. God said, don't do it. You, wanna, you, you want to have physical relations with someone, you had better be married to him or to her. And if you're not, it's wrong. I don't care how many talk shows they have. I don't care how many uh, shows on television and modern family and postmodern family and uh, parenthood and all the rest of the garbage that gets fed to us down this pipe every day doesn't matter how many uh, shrinks in Hollywood get together and try to figure out America's problems and try to tell us how to live. Amen. Uh, worse yet, the people who, who watch it and say, I can't believe this. 
turn it off. Amen. Amen. Turn it off. They're making them now where you can turn them off. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad? You may, some of you don't know that. It's that comforting blue flicker all night long, you know. You know, drive down the street, everybody's got a TV on, right? You can turn it off. It's possible to do so. You say, well, I don't like how they're doing well, it. Well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the culture says or what the media says. God honors marriage. And he said, this is the way to do it. And we could figure out, believe me, I know you're smarter than I am. It wouldn't take much. Uh, you know how you can work it out and how you can figure it out to where, hey, you can see people who are married who are totally miserable, and I don't want that, and I can see how marriage doesn't do anything for you. I had parents who were married for 40, 50 years, and look what they did, and you can tell me all the reasons, but you can't get around the word of God that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what Fox News says, or at ABC, or CBS, or any shrink or professor you have in school, they change their minds as they go along. Christians change their minds as they go along, depending on whether it's their daughter or son involved in adultery or not. Amen, amen, and amen. Uh, I, had a, I had a young lady. I've got an apartment for rent. I had a young lady uh, contact me. And actually, it was a young man contact me. And the young man contacted me about uh, the house that I have for rent. And he said, I'd like to move here and uh, live here with my girlfriend. And he said, oh, by the way, I think she knows you. And I happen to know the young lady. And uh, I didn't come down hard on him. I just said, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I said, if I am not supposed to do it, and I'm a Christian supposed to follow the word of God, then it's not right for me to facilitate you committing adultery either. And hey, I'm not saying I'm some super Christian. That used to be the norm. That was the norm. Now what is the norm? The norm is do whatever you want. Do whatever feels right. And then scream bloody murder the person who says, no, don't do that. Hold up signs and, and, and protest people who are going to stop you from your freedom. You know what the epitome of stupidity is? Homosexuals equating their struggle with the civil rights movement. <clears throat> that's what it is. But that's the way it goes. That's the way mankind goes. It's not just that I want you to allow me in the, in, the, in the sanctity and the privacy of my own home to do what I want. No, I want you to commend me for it. I want you to celebrate my wickedness with me. I want you to award me for doing bad, for doing wrong. And I'm just saying this, guys, if they're so all fire concerned about going against the word of God when it comes to marriage, when it comes to one man, one woman, one lifetime, but who wants a marriage license? Why does that matter? Why does it matter that you, everyone recognize you as, recognizes you as legitimately married when you've already determined you can do whatever you want anyhow? I cease to understand how the marriage has become uh, uh, this gigantic royal procession that all of my best friends and my most unbelievably pre specially prepared and, and hired out the very best, they're all coming to my wedding. I don't get that, especially when you're living in adultery for 10 months, two years, seven to 10 years, and now you want to have a royal wedding? I don't believe in it. I think it's wrong. Do you, do you understand what symbolism is? You know what the unity candle is? The unity candle? That's where his side of the family and her side of the family, they come together now. They take these two candles, and what, it could be sand. It could be Plato. You know, next would be Plato. <laughs> Building a house together, you know. Legos. I can see that will be coming in pretty soon, someday. It's a symbol. All right. I'm not criticizing. I, I happen to be just a little cynical. I, I saw a lot of weddings and marriages in my time, and I saw a lot of hilarious things. But, uh, you know, the symbol, by the way, of, of a white wedding dress. Does anyone know what that represents? Purity. Purity. Or, starts with a V, virginity. Virginity. That's what a white wedding dress stands for. So what color should you wear if you're not a virgin when you get married? I don't know. You choose. Just shouldn't be white. 
Amen. We're going to shave close tonight. And not because, and not, and not because I think I'm so big and bad. I'm, I'm here to give you the Word of God. The Word of God says that marriage is important. And, and if you say, well, it's not fair. I have needs and wants. Aren't you training your two-year-old better than that? You let them throw a fit and scream and cry when they don't get to eat when they want to eat. You got to teach them how to say no to yourself. You learn how to say no to yourself. Amen. Amen. I'm talking to those of you. You say, well, I just, it's not fair. Everybody else, no, no, no. Don't play that card with God about what's fair and not fair. He watched his own son die on the cross for you. Talk to him about what's fair and what's not fair. Fair is where you get cotton candy. <laughs> Amen. If God said it, then that's what we're supposed to do. And you should go to a martyr's cross before you give it up. That's easier said than done, believe me. But you can start small. Start, start small. Such as, don't let that person get anywhere near you if they've got something bad on their mind. Amen. Amen. And that, by the way, adultery, it, that goes for un, un, unmarried people. It goes for married people as well. It goes for married people. So we're going to talk about marriage tonight and, and seven ways to love your spouse. Now let's get into this thing before everybody hates me. Are you ready? <laughs> All the adulterers are looking at me with, you know, staring. I... <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Number one, here's how you can love your spouse. Give yourself for your spouse. This whole passage is not, as we typically think of, about husbands and wives. It's actually about Christ and the church. Verse 32 says that. I speak concerning Christ and the church, and yet it's such a beautiful picture of Christ and his bride, the church, that it fits with husbands and wives. Give yourself for your spouse. When you give to your spouse, you are being consistent with the example of Jesus Christ, how he dealt with relationships on the earth. You never find Jesus Christ saying no to someone because he didn't feel like it. He said no to someone because it was a doctrinal issue. He would say, it's not meat to cast the the children's food to the dogs, because he was sent to the house of Israel. But even in that case, with a little pushback from the Syrophoenician woman, he allowed her to receive the crumbs that fall from the master's table. But when it came to relationships, you didn't find Christ saying, go away, you bother me. I've got other things to do. In his relationships, he constantly gave to people. Gave and gave and gave. You want to know how to love your spouse? And some of you could tell me this. You've been doing it since before I was born. But we're going to look here what the scripture says. The scripture says Christ loved the church and gave himself. Gave himself. You know, when you're busy giving, you're not expecting something in return. And if you're expecting something in return, you're not quite as busy at giving as you should be. Or you're not giving in the, in the correct manner. That's what children do. Children say, I'll give you one of my toys. And they give you one of your one of their toys. And then they say, what are you going to give me? They don't get the concept of giving. You and I, many times in the case of marriage, we don't get the concept of giving. I want to give something to her so that she will give something to me. Is that true giving? It's not biblical. See, Christ gave himself for the church. <laughs> what a payoff, huh? You and I. We are the reward of his suffering. He considered it worthy. He considered us worth the cost, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him. The joy of working with you and I. Amen. We're fallen and frail. So when we talk about giving to our spouse, don't think you're the first one that's ever tried to do it. Christ gave himself for the church. How do you give yourself for your spouse? Well, you don't give them what you would want. You give them what they want. You give them what they want. Now, that's the tough one, isn't it? Because we know what they want. That's how you do it. You give yourself. And giving yourself means it's not what I want to get from you. It's what I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you my will and my desire, my ability to make the choice and say, this is what I want in my marriage. And I give that away to her. And the wife gives that desire of what she wants 
to her husband. You know, many times giving yourself comes down to T-I-M-E, time. Sometimes it comes down to attention. Sometimes it comes down to money. Amen? When I say sometimes, I mean always. <laughs> the way it feels in marriage, huh? Giving yourself. Giving yourself. What do you have? Well, you don't have anything really that's m worth more than your time. Because it's your time that it takes to make money. If you didn't have any time, you couldn't make any money. You've got to, to give them time. You've got to give them what they want. You look at Christ here. It says, uh, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And it's not based on the worthiness of the object. It's based on the surrender of the giver. It's not based on the worthiness of the recipient. It's based on the heart and the surrendered attitude of the giver. He gave himself for it. So in our marriages, what do we do? We give ourselves what we want, what we think is important to our spouse. Amen. Now, don't look at me like this. I know what, I know what it is. We don't like to hear preaching and teaching on, on marriage many times. Why? Because I'd rather hear stuff about the return of the Lord, amen, and the end times, and the mark of the beast. That's getting some cool stuff. And hey, it is cool, no doubt about it. And I'm looking for the, for the Lord to return. I hope when he returns, he finds me having a good marriage and not rescuing me from my marriage. Miserable. I, I said something the other day in Sunday school. I won't repeat again, Brother Cheedy. I don't care how many times you ask me to do it. But I said, if you're going to live a miserable life as a married person, then that's not God's will for your life. That's not what God wants. You say, well, you wait until you're married to my spouse. No, you are married to your spouse. And you promised God that you would love them, that you would serve them, that you would cherish them. You promised God. And if you didn't promise God, then you're not married. You're living in adultery. So if you promised God, don't give me this thing of, well, if you were living with him, you, can, you don't understand. Now, I know there's circumstances in which the, the two parties in marriage are determined not to live with one another. And there's no way around it. And guess what? That's not God's idea. You know, they, they spend multi-millions worth of dollars on jet airplanes. You know what they put in that jet airplane? They put an ejection seat. And that ejection seat is built in there not to use. They don't want you to use the ejection seat. Why? You're talking about millions of dollars in the plane itself and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in the training of the guy sitting in the pilot's seat. That is a huge asset to the United States government. So when they put that ejection seat in there, that is in the worst possible last minute thing. You get, nothing else will work. You're about to lose. Uh, you're going down in flames. You're going to die. Pull the ejection, sheet, ejection seat. But when you pull that, you just ruined a really good thing. It has the potential of being used for something great. I'm not saying that God doesn't give that to people. I'm saying God put that in there, never expecting you to use it. Never. Why is it in there then? Because God's a merciful God. And he's gracious. You think you got into the plane to pull the ejection seat? What kind of pilot are you? You got in the plane to do the mission. And the mission is to have a full, happy, fulfilling, satisfying marriage. You say, well, I don't think we can have that. Well, have you started at verse number 25? Giving to your spouse. Have you started there? Giving yourself for your spouse. Number two, look at verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Number two, encourage your spouse in godliness. Now, the difference between you and I when we talk about marriage is that none of us comes as Jesus Christ to the church. None of us comes as one perfect spouse to an imperfect spouse. Now, I have met some preachers uh, and some male Christians who kind of consider themselves to be very close to Jesus Christ. And they're going to help their spouse along. And to that, to that I say, gag. <laughs> gag. <laughs> uh, I'm... She must have been blind, deaf, and dumb when she married you. 
So I'm not talking about that. N neither, there, is, there are no perfect spouses. But when you come to your spouse, you ought to come with that same mindset. Christ's desire was he gave himself for the church so that he could sanctify and cleanse it. He saw the possibilities, he saw the potential in the church. And so he gave himself for it, and then he went to work cleaning it and purifying it. That he might sanctify it. Encouraging your spouse in godliness. How is that? Well, you can allow your spouse to spend some time with the Lord alone and work to make sure that they have that option. I don't say that you should grab your spouse and say, hey, you need to go read your Bible right now. I heard that a lot from my siblings growing up. Have you read your Bible today? No, I could tell. Yeah, I missed that sweet time with the Lord that you had this morning. <laughs> you know, nearer to thee. Yes, I know, I know. But you ought to allow your spouse some time. You ought to work to help your spouse have time to spend with the Lord. Well, I will when she gets done with the dishes and <laughs> cleans the house. Yeah, you're really giving yourself, aren't you, bud? You're really bending over backwards. Make this a glorious home for the Lord. <laughs> Give yourself some, your, your spouse the opportunity. Ask your spouse, hey, what's the Lord been teaching you in your life? You know, if, if you can ask your spouse, where do you want to go on vacation? That means that you've got a level of communication. Now, and that's a good thing to do, by the way. <laughs> where you're not just, we're going here. You can ask him, what do you, what do you think? Where do you want to go, right? And, and then you can say this. Uh, hey, what do you think about the, uh, where should we send the kids to school, right? Uh, what kind of car do you want to drive? Um, what, uh, what do you think about this house? Would like to move? Do you want to move? You know, can we afford to move? Can anybody afford to move? <laughs> if we could, what house would you? If you're able to talk to your spouse on that level about those things, you ought to be able to talk to your spouse about spiritual things. Now, you as the, as, the, as the husband and father, I'm sorry, I'm not a great uh, priest of my home. I know scripturally speaking, probably there's a symbol there, there's a typology as far as the father being a, a priest to a certain degree, not, don't take it all the way, some people do. But uh, as far as my wife, I don't consider myself as the mediator between her and God. But, uh, because she's not, because I'm not the mediator between her and God. But I do look at it this way. I should be able to say to my spouse, how are things going spiritually? And my spouse ought to be able to say the same thing to me. You know, once every 10 years, maybe. That's all I could handle it. And, and if she can't, what's the problem? And here's the bigger thing. Why would she have to ask that many times if she, she would only ask that in the worst case scenario? Why would she have to, right? So encourage one another spiritually. Hey, what's the Lord been teaching you this week? You might say this year. Uh, spread it out a little bit and say, hey, what, uh, what, did, what did you think about the sermon this morning? Not this morning. <laughs> Last Sunday. What did you, you think about? Uh, what did you think about when preacher said uh, he was talking about that one passage there? You want uh, wives? You want to knock your your uh, husband's socks off? Ask him what he thinks about a Bible passage without just wanting to tell him what you think about the Bible passage. I'm like, that's a, that's a, that's a good little bait and switch right there. <laughs> right? Why? Because you are encouraging that person in godliness. Look what Christ did. It said, he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water. You want to encourage your spouse to be more godly. Don't lead your spouse into carnality. Are you the one, you know, and sometimes in Christian homes it's this way. There's one spouse that was raised kind of out in the world doing the, the things of the world, carnal lifestyle. And there's one spouse that's more uh, super spiritual, godly, raised in church, you know, never, never saw any movies, never went anywhere, never did anything. You know what, you're not really getting a badge of honor when you teach your spouse things that are carnal. You're not really going up the ladder. Well, now, I, you know, I, cannot, I don't have to be embarrassed when I take her out with me. So she, she knows all the junk that I know now. Amen. We're talking about carnality. And, and what did Christ do? You, you think Christ doesn't know about sin? He became sin on the cross. 
But what did he do, do with his bride? He wants to sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing water. He wants her to be pure. He wants her to be set apart, to be separate from carnality. Do you encourage that? You know what the world is? The world is, is ready at the drop of a hat to say, oh, do you need something to do? Do you need something to do right now? As if you want to do some, spend some quality time together? Well, I've got a great movie for you right here. It's full, I know it's full of all kinds of junk. You've got to fast forward you know, 95% of it. But it's a, it's a romantic movie. You can sit down and watch it. Oh, you need a romantic dinner out together. Of course, you've got to have a nice bottle of wine, you know, and you've got to have all these things. Just as romance. It's romance. Encourage your spouse in godliness. I didn't say force them to have a Bible study with you. You're boring. <laughs> Just keep that in mind as we plow through the scriptures together. You're boring. I'm not saying you force them to have Bible studies with you. You encourage your spouse in godliness. If you're not careful, all you ever do is, is snap at them and say, did you get that done? Did you get this done? What are we doing here? Why can't we get this fixed? Can we go there? Aren't we ever, hey, can we have a clean house? One meal a year? What do you think? One meal? <laughs> if we're not careful, we constantly are like little dogs yapping at our spouses. But Christ loved the church, gave himself for it, so he could clean her up. Clean her up. Why is it that every successive generation has to get more godless, more carnal, more sensual? Why? Well, that's just the way it goes. No, it's not. That's the way you go. That's what you do with your family. You drop the standards. You let them go, go down. Why? Because it's just too much work. I don't believe in holding up standards for standards' sake. I believe in holding up standards when God leads you to hold up standards. And it says Christ gave himself that he might sanctify what? The church, you and I, and cleanse it with the washing water. So encourage your spouse in godliness. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Number three, Ephesians 5.27, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Number three, work to make your spouse a better person. Now here is where it gets tricky. This is thin ice right here. When you make an attempt to improve your spouse, uh, that's not necessarily a good idea. I want you to be a better person than you are. That doesn't sound good, and it doesn't go down very well at all. But I, this is exactly what Christ did. He says that he, he sanctified it and cleansed it with the washing of water, that he might present it to himself. The church is not now perfect. The only time that you're, you and I are going to be perfect, as far as sinless, is when we get to heaven. So the Lord is constantly working with us to make us sanctified and clean so that he might, at some point, present it to himself. Now that's not saying he might, he might not. That's saying that it's a future thing. The reason he's doing this is that he can, at some point, present you and I unto himself as a glorious church. Now, again, there are no perfect spouses. So for me, thinking as a husband, I want my wife to be a godly, great woman. I want to make her better. And so I need to go to her, and I need to let her know, this A, B, and C, sweetheart, is gotta, it's got to go. This attitude's got to go. This, this is not Christ-honoring. You've got you why? Because if you think you got a list, your wife's got a list twice as long of things that you're going to have to fix, bub, and then we'll talk. Then we'll have a Bible study. <laughs> At that point. <laughs> Amen. Are you with me tonight? Now I know you guys are going, I can't believe he's saying this. <laughs> right? But the truth of the matter is, you and I, when we look at our spouses, if we were to say, I love you just the way you are, I would change nothing, you are lying. <laughs> You're lying. Why? Because we're human beings, we're faulty, we're full of failures, we do stupid things, we need to change. We need to change. It's daily purification. And let me ask you this, are you concerned with being a better person? Well, then you ought to be concerned with helping your spouse be a better person. Now, here's the hard part. You can't walk up to them and say, I'd like, to, I'd like for you to be a better person. I mean, you could say that. And as you try to look, through, open your eyes the next day. <laughs> Is that you, sweetheart? Come here. 
right? <laughs> it's not going to work. But I could do this. Let me ask you this. How does Christ make you a better person? Does he wake you up in the morning saying, get out of bed, you lazy bum. It's called the Bible. Read it. <laughs> what else do I have to do? Is that how the Lord gets you out of bed? Doesn't, it doesn't do it for me. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? When you come to church, it's like, hey, you idiot, get down here and get right with God. Now, some of you would love that, right? You're like, oh, that, yes, I need that. But most of us, we hear that, we go, I'm not getting right with God. I'll get right with God, I'm ready. How does the Holy Spirit make you a better person? He does that by a kind voice. He does it by consistent example. Jesus Christ makes you and I a better person. How? By just being the same. He's always the same. When we're excited and we're pumped up and we're really having a great week, he's the same. When we hate the world and each of our children and our spouse and our boss, he's the same. He never changes. That's how he makes us a better person. And we listen to that still small voice. Now, you and I are not the Holy Spirit of God, but maybe we could borrow the template and we could ratchet it down and make it fit on our frail human bodies and say, I want to help make my spouse a better person. If you were trying to make your spouse a better person, you would encourage them and be willing to help them in anything that would make them a better person. Not saying, oh, yes, 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 please go and be a better person, but being willing. If you saw an inkling of your spouse trying to improve in an area, you would say, not, oh, good, you're finally coming around. You would say to them, man, I need to work on some stuff. You're really, you're really challenging me. You're, you're really stepping up your game. And uh, I just want you to know I appreciate it. And uh, it makes me realize I've got a lot to work on. Now, you say, oh, I'm sorry, that's just not how we talk. Do your thing. Do your thing. Whatever you want to do. We don't do it. Are you man enough and woman enough to act like Jesus Christ? Or you just want to pretend that you're a Christian and live in your generation's box? Last time I checked, the Lord doesn't deal with generations the way we deal with generations. He cuts through the nonsense and says, you want to live like Christ? Here's how it is. One size fits all. And if you don't want to do it, then you do your own thing. Well, that's just not how we do it. Well, maybe you're doing it wrong. Maybe you're doing it wrong. Why? Because every generation has a strength in some area, and they have a weakness in another area. My dad used to tell us all the time, he never heard his dad say that he loved him until he was maybe in his 20s. And some of you right now have the same experience. Your grandparents never said they loved their children, or your, your parents never told you that they loved you. May I say to you, that was wrong. I'm not saying they didn't love you. I'm saying it was wrong for them not to tell you that they loved you. And you say, well, I don't think they did anything wrong. Why do you keep telling everybody that then? It kind of bothers you, doesn't it? You know why it bothers you? Because they should have said it. They should have not just acted on it and not just proved it with their actions. They should have verbally told you, I love you and accept you as my son. You say, well, that's just, we, we never did that in our time. Well, you should have done it in your time. And you can fix it now and start doing it in your time. What if God just showed us by his actions and never gave us a written verbal agreement and understanding of his love to us? How will we possibly know him? We could not know him. We could only guess why, he, why was he doing this. And there would be, you'd think it's bad now with the plethora of religions. There would be a myriad of ideas as to why Christ did this. We had no idea why, but he came down. We don't really know. We just have to figure it out. And a lot of Christian or people in the world think that we do. I'm here to tell you that God wrote it down explicitly why he did what he did and what he meant when he did it. What's wrong with verbally saying to your spouse, to your children, I love you, I think you're the best spouse that I could possibly have, and saying to our children, I am so proud of you. You say, well, they've got problems and faults. For God so loved the world that was perfect that he gave his only begotten son for no reason. Are you with me tonight? Verbalizing your love. 
being able to say, I love you. I want to make you a better person. What can I do to help you become a better person? And when I say this to you, I'm not saying that I'm better than you. I am saying I feel that it is my job as a spouse to help you become more like Christ. What am I doing that is keeping you back from becoming more like Christ? Now, I'm, I, I'm not deluded. I think 1% maybe of this crowd that I'm speaking to will ever say that to their spouse. I'm not deluded. But you can't tell me that that's not a good thing that you should say to your spouse. Just whether or not you have the spiritual fortitude to humble yourself and say, I am one with you. I'm going to open. It's not the man race and the female race. God looks at you and he sees one person. One flesh. Did he not say that? He did say that. One flesh. And so when he is talking to you, he's talking to your spouse. When he's talking to your spouse, he's talking to you. He's talking to both of us. Number four, we gotta get on, we gotta get out of here. This is dangerous territory. <laughs> Number four, Ephesians 5, 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Number four, practice the golden rule with your spouse. Practice the golden rule with your spouse. Now, this, is e this whole message is easier said than done. It's easier to stand up here and tell you how to do it. I got to go home with a spouse. And I am standing up here telling you all how to be a spouse, and I get to go home, and my, my wife is going, <laughs> What are you thinking? Oh, nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> but it's true, ain't it? It's true. Practice the golden rule with your spouse. What does that mean? It means love the idiot like you wish the idiot would love you. Amen. Don't put a super spiritual suit on with me. I was raised in a very conservative home, in a home where uh, people looked up to our family, mainly because we were on the platform and they were sitting down, but they, <laughs> they, they looked at our family, and what, what did I have for mother, for mother and dad? I had a man and a woman for my mom and dad, normal, regular man and woman, who struggled like everybody else struggled, just, just normal human beings. And what's the difference? I don't, that Jesus Christ was the difference. That's the only reason that they're still married after 50 years. That's the only reason. That's the only reason why you're married tonight. That's the only reason why I'm married. So when I talk about practicing the golden rule, I'm talking about Jesus Christ who said, they twain shall be one flesh. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. That's the golden rule, by the way. The words golden rule did not appear in scripture. But... That is the golden rule. Do ye even so to them. What I want him to do to me, I should do to him. What I want her to do for me, I should do for her. Now here's the kicker. You're not supposed to do it for them so that they will do for you. That's not true charity. True charity is I'm going to give you something that's valuable to me and I expect nothing in return. And you don't get mad at them if they try to return it. That's another form of pride. I'm going to give something to you, and I expect nothing. I walk away, and I expect nothing from you. Now, you're not heaping coals of fire on your enemy's head. That's not the idea here. That's your enemy. Your spouse is not your enemy. You are doing something that is charitable, something that is Christ-like, something that is selfless. What could it be? What could it be? Imagine, right now, if your spouse were thinking the same exact way about you as you were thinking about them. Well, I'll change when they change. I'll make the first step when they make the first step. We're all like that, aren't we? Because we all know what we want. And we all get mad when we don't get it. We just learn to use different words and different mannerisms and sometimes verses to change the way we act. Practice the golden rule. Well, how do you take care of yourself? I want you to go to Isaiah uh, 58. Great verse here. Isaiah 58. We're moving along swiftly. We're at number four. We have three more to go. Before you know it, we'll all have happy marriages and we'll be out of here. 
Isaiah 58. I'm not waiting for that. <laughs> Believe me, I've got other things to do. 58. Isaiah 58, and here we are in the middle of uh, what, what he considers to be a true fast before the Lord. And I just want to borrow this verse from this context. He's speaking to Israel here, but I want to borrow this verse. And, and he's talking about what a real fast would be for the children of Israel. Not what they called it, what they did. But he said this is what it should be. Is it not, verse 7, to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. You know, that's, that represents a lot of marriages right there. Hiding yourself from your own flesh. Is that even possible? Apparently it is. He said, if you want to have a true fast where you're really trying to get a hold of God, then don't hide yourself from your own flesh. Don't pretend to be super spiritual when really all you're doing is trying to get away from your spouse. A lot of folks will do that. I just need some time with the Lord. We think, I just need time by myself away from you. Don't hide yourself from your flesh, from your own flesh. God says you're one flesh. So how do you take care of your flesh? What is it that you do that takes care of you? When's the last time you thought about your spouse and how you're supposed to take care of your spouse? This is what it takes to have a godly, Christ-honoring marriage. And no wonder it's so hard, because it goes against me, the guy that I shave every morning. I look at that guy and I say, man, we need to figure out how in the world we can make this a good day for you. What do you need? I say to myself, what can I get you? Well, there's a few things you could get me. And we have a nice long conversation. I'll be honest with you, I really like that guy. Because he's concerned about me. But then the Lord comes by and he taps me on the shoulder and says, Hey, do you consider anybody else in your life but yourself? And I say, Well, yeah, souls, you know, ministry. What about the one that's supposed to be one flesh with you? Well, you know, she's got the Holy Spirit of God inside of her and he's working with her and he'll take, you know, she was raised right and she can do it. The Lord says, Nope. That's why I put you in her life to help her. I put you in her life. I put you in his life so that you could be a blessing to that person. So that you could make their life joyful. Instead of you always having to sit down and have them take care of you and always you have to be propped up by him or her, now I want you to turn around and with Christ-like love, I want you to think how you can be a blessing to him or how you can be a blessing to her. Now this goes against the grain. It really does. And that's why he said Christ had to die in order to gain his bride. Because it gets really close to dying. <laughs> when, I'm when I'm having to think about my spouse first, that's pretty, I might as well be dead. The Lord says, yeah, you might as well be dead. Die to your flesh. Practice the golden rule with your spouse. What liberties do you allow yourself? What kind of money do you spend on yourself? What feelings or attitudes do you tolerate in yourself? And everybody's supposed to just get along and deal with it and build their universe around you and your attitudes. When's the last time you said, you know what? This attitude stinks. I apologize. I have been hard on everybody. I have been King Farouk walking around telling everybody what to do, what not to do. And I'm sorry about that. I have had attitudes and I blame it on everything. I blame it on being a woman or I blame it on being a man or I blame it on the way I was raised or I blame it on all the difficulties we have. And the truth of the matter is I've just been a jerk and I'm sorry about that. Just an idea. Just an idea. Number five. Ephesians 5, 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. Number five, nourish and cherish your spouse. Nourish and cherish your spouse. Nourish means to provide with the food or other substances necessary for growth. It, it shares the same word as, uh, the same root word as nutrition. You go back, I think it's a French word. And uh, it has to do with, with nutrition, with the, 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 necess the necessities for growth, health, good condition. It deals mainly with the internal with the internal. 
He said, no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it. So how do I practice the golden rule? I seek to nourish my spouse. I seek to help my spouse grow and to be a better person. Not because I think they need to come up to my level, but because I, I genuinely care about myself. No question there. And God says, just turn that thing around and not just care for yourself. Now care for your spouse with the same kind of care, the same kind of love and attention. Now, this is not popular preaching. I'm not going to get invited to fellowship meetings and church, you know, nationwide meetings. Why? Because it, it's not easy to do. And here I am as a young man saying this to some, that, some of you who have been married for many, many years. But the truth of the matter is this. The strength of Hope Baptist Church in large part comes down to the strength of our marriages. Not, to, not, not the strength of how well you can tell your kids what to do. They don't have a choice. Your spouse has a choice. They have a choice in whether or not they get along with you. And you have a choice in whether or not you're going to treat them Christ-like or not. And that is the strength of the church is in the relationships. The relationships we have. And one of the number one relationships in this church is that of husband and wife. Cherish means to protect and care for. Cherish deals mainly with the external, whereas nourish would be more of the internal. What is it that helps your spouse to just light up? What gets him or her interested? What is something that, that would help them to flourish? Find out what that is and provide it for them. Go after it. When is the last time you thought about, you know what, I'm going to do something nice for my spouse. Something that will just make their day. I'm going to do it. You say, well, I wish we could get back to something super spiritual and less convicting. Why? Because this is where the rubber meets the road. We could talk all about how we have a burden. Oh, I have a burden for souls. You spend more time with your spouse over 25, 30 years than you do with anybody else. That ought to be the number one relationship in your life. Number one. If you look at leaving your house as an escape and as, oh, I can breathe again, something is not right in your life. Something is not right. And you can come to church and look great and shake, hey, your brother, good to see you. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? Get that nice little bounce there. <laughs> Amen. Isn't it great? And go home and say, hey, you parked your broom right in my way. <laughs> we can be nasty to our spouses, can't we? Why? Because they deserve it. I, I just don't believe that's God's will for our homes. That's not Christ honoring. And I don't think that God suddenly goes, where's that scale? Let's get that scale out here. All right, well, they're winning souls. They're terrible to their spouse, but they're winning some souls here, and they're faithful to church. Oh, it's coming in good. This is going to be good for them. Where does the scale come from? It doesn't come anywhere. That's going to be wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. That's going to burn up. I would rather be able to look, the Lord to look down and say, hey, you've got just barely a little tiny gemstone here. No gold and silver. Forget that, but you've got a little precious stone here. That's your marriage. I'd rather have that than all wood, hay, and stubble that completely is burned up because I didn't spend any time and I didn't care. All I cared about was the Lord and getting to church and reading my Bible and staying faithful to the Lord. When I didn't spend time on my spouse, the one person that Christ placed so close and closer than anyone else and I didn't want to take the time to spend with them and talk to them and bear my heart because I was too scared of digging down and finding out who I really was inside. And I kept blaming my generation and saying, well, we didn't say it. We didn't say it. God said it. God told people when he was mad. He told people when he was glad. He told people how much he loved them. He gave himself for it. So get off your high horse. Truth of the matter is, you're scared running. You don't know how to say nice things to people. Because you weren't raised that way. So now you get a pass for the rest of your life. You don't have to say kind and nice things because nobody said kind and nice things to you. So you'll just show everybody. You are on a high horse, sweetheart, and you need to get down off of it right now. I'll tell you why. Because your Savior bled and died for you. And when's the last time he ever got something that 
was worthy of his sacrifice. No, 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 no. Don't come to him and say, Lord, it's just not fair. The Lord says, I've given you all you need. Maybe you need to open up your heart to your spouse a little bit. You say, this just seems like a Gary Smalley seminar. I don't know what's going on. The five love languages, what are we doing here? We're talking about a little thing called real life. Real life. Not shirt and tie religion. We're talking about waking up at 6 a.m. We're talking about getting out the door when it's dark and coming home when it's dark. We're talking about working hard, paying bills, trying to fix cars that never can stay fixed. Dragging yourself to doctor's appointments. Sitting up late with somebody who's having a hard time. Tossing and turning in bed because they have some kind of a problem. And, and you go in and, and you're trying to figure out how you can help them. You're trying to work your way through your life. Trying to see how, how, how can we live this Christian life. I'm talking about real blue collar Christianity. A lot of it is husband and wife. Husband and wife. And I can tell you this. When mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. When daddy ain't happy, mamas ain't happy, ain't happy. And when mamas ain't happy, nobody's happy. Basically, it comes down to this. If your marriage is not right, your family's not going to be right. If your family's not right, this church is not going to be right. It really gets down to the nuts and bolts of it. Number six. Let's get out of here. Number 31, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Forsake others for your spouse. Forsake others for your spouse. Leave your parents behind. All right? Now, there comes a point when you have to leave your parents behind. Well, we raised you. We, we think we have a say in your life. And, and they, they do. The Bible says, honor thy father and mother. But there comes a point we need to be able to walk away and say, Mom and Dad, we love you. We're going to be gone for about 10 years and we'll be right back. <laughs> I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about those controlling strings. You need to be able to walk away from that. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother. Leave your friends you know, some of you have bad ideas in your head about your spouse because of what your friends say about your spouse. Right? Oh, girlfriend, if he said that to me, mm, <laughs> stop talking to that girl. Stop talking to her. She is not married. Hello? <laughs> of course, she knows all about how it's all supposed to be done. She's never been married. And if she is married, we know who is in charge of that home, don't we? Amen. Stop talking to people that downplay your spouse. Don't talk to them. The Bible says you're supposed to leave those people and cleave to one another. Leave your job. Leave your ministry. Leave your hobbies and cleave to your spouse. If all of your time is taken up with other things, you, are, you don't have a Christ-honoring marriage. There needs to be time with you and your spouse. Number seven. This is the last one. Reverence your husband, love your wife. Ephesians 5.33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. There's been books written about this. It's a wonderful thought. Love and respect is one that comes to mind. Great book. But it was in scripture all along. There it is. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, talking to the husband's, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. It just so happens to be that this lines up with the, the deepest needs that each spouse feels. A husband needs respect. He needs respect. That's what a man needs is respect. That's what he lives for. That's what 99% of sports is about, respect. That's what the biggest part of his job and trying to get a promotion. He wants respect. He wants people to look at him and say, you do a good job. You know what you're doing. You are capable. You do a good job. I'm, I'm impressed with your work. That's what a man wants. And I wouldn't give you two nickels for a man that didn't want that. But a wife needs love. She needs that love. And isn't it just kind of strike you as ironic that those are the two hardest things for our spouses to give us? It's hard for the wife to give her husband respect. Why? Because she knows him. She knows everything about him. You know what that does? It makes it hard for the husband to love his wife because he get no respect. I get no respect, right? And the wife says, well, I'll give you some respect when you show me some love. And then here goes the cat and the dog rolling down the hill together. So the Lord says, reverence your husband, love your wife. 
What should I do? Well, what, what, uh, uh, what gender are you? Are you male gender? Then you should love your wife. And just cut the rest of that verse out of your Bible in your mind. Just cut it out. Why? Because you say, well, he told you to do that. So if, I can, if you can disobey, then I can disobey. No, 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 no. We're not three years old anymore. We're grown up people. We're married. So just in your mind, remove the other side of it and say, I'm going to do what God told me to do because I'm not a wife. I'm a husband. So I'm going to do what God told the husbands to do. And wives, you pick up the Bible and you look at that and it says, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That, what does that mean? That's deep respect. Deep respect. The wife see that she reverence her husband. You know what that's called? That's called living by faith. Living by faith. Why? Because he don't deserve it, right? And who knows that better than you? No one. He does not deserve deep respect for the way he lives, the things that he does, the things that he doesn't do. He doesn't deserve respect. Well, the Lord just didn't put any qualification in there. I'm looking here. <laughs> Likewise, he was. Uh, it says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Sarah called Abraham Lord, the liar that he was. He was a liar. He was embarrassed to be known as her husband. And yet, she called him Lord. That's deep respect. Now, I, this is, I don't even know why I'm reading this verse. It doesn't apply to us today. I'm not by any stretch of the imagination. Respect? Are you kidding me? It's equal. It's equal, man. It's 50-50. That's how we roll in the 21st century. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say that the husband is 75 and the wife is 25. The Bible does not say that the wife is 75 and the husband is 25 or 95 and 5. The Bible says you both are a hundred. You're one flesh. So you're both a hundred. And you both are to give what God told you to give, no matter if you feel like it or not. And if you will do that, what you will find is this. Your spouse will open like a flower. It's been hiding because of the rain. And after that rain, it'll open up. And you'll find that you and your spouse are talking about things you never dreamed that you'd talk about. You are fellowshipping together about things. You are, if you will humble yourself, the Bible says faithful are the wounds of a what? Of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I'd rather have my spouse hurt me if it's going to help me in the end. It's not easy, though, is it? It's a challenge. Seven ways to love your spouse. Let's stand tonight with our heads bowed. If the Lord's spoken to your heart and you want to come, this is more of a Bible study than anything, but the Lord put it on my heart. We uh, stretched it longer than I wanted to, but... That's the way it goes. The Lord has spoken to your heart and you want to come down and talk to him about it. You can do so. Uh, I don't expect anybody necessarily to come. I know that uh, many times uh, these are very personal matters, very challenging things. We look at, talk about our, our marriages, very important things. I want you to know tonight, and we're not going to sing or anything else. We're just going to pray and we'll be dismissed. And uh, let me just encourage you to look past Look past everything but to the truth of the Word of God and ask yourself in your heart, Lord, am I where I need to be in my marriage? Not do I have the marriage that so-and-so has or am I acting like this brother or sister over here, but Lord, do I have the marriage that honors you? And even further than that, Lord, am I the spouse that you want me to be? Whatever the Lord tells you to do, just start working on it. If it's like my situation, when I say that to the Lord, I get a laundry list of things. The Lord says, well, now that you mention it, and I say, I don't know where to start. The Lord says, just start with one right here, and then we'll go to two, and work on three later. So just ask the Lord tonight, Lord, what is it in my marriage that I need to change? What is it in my heart that I need to get rid of? How can I be more like Christ as a spouse. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful to be in your house tonight. Thank you for the attentiveness and the patience of your people. Lord, this subject I know is, uh, is, is one that challenges me a great deal. And uh, I need a lot of help. I pray that you'd help each member here tonight. Lord, I pray for those who are uh, uh, waiting on a spouse. Lord, I certainly do not mean to uh, 
play, make that light in any way. For I understand that uh, many times uh, circumstances are out of our control, and sometimes uh, there's separation, sometimes there's divorce. And Father, I thank you that you are truly a God of mercy and grace, that you are a God of comfort and a God of love. And Lord, you uh, sent Hosea to go and love a woman that was despised. And Lord, you have loved us, have given us grace and mercy, and I'm thankful for that. But Lord, I pray before we ever would get to that point, there's some here who are not yet to that point, and I pray that you'd protect them. I pray that you'd help them. I pray that you'd draw them closer to yourself, and I pray that they would leave tonight as a better spouse. Lord, I pray that this week would be a great week in the marriages of Hope Baptist Church. May we unite together under your cause, realizing that you created us for one another and that we are one flesh in your eyes. Lord, we ask that you would bless us now as we go. We thank you for the chance to be here for the beautiful sunshine you've given us today. Thank you for a place, a building that we can meet in. We thank you for a pastor who loves you and has faithfully served you all these years. I pray I thank you for his wife as well, for the support that she has been to him all these years. I pray that you'd bless us now as we go. We thank you for what you've done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.